In this video, we're going to look at change of variables. Well, we called in Calculus 1 a U substitution, but now we want to do it with integrals of two variables. So let's take a look again at the single variable case. I've got an integral, and I'm going to use a change of variables. So I define an equation relating my old variable to my new variable. In this case, u equals 1 minus 3x. I find the connection between the differential du and the differential dx. And then I change the bounds of integration, which gives me a new integral in terms of u. So note that there are three fundamental changes. We need an equation or a function describing the new variable in terms of the old variable. We need to determine the relation between the old and the new differentials. And we need to change the bounds of integration. So how would a change of variable help us with a double integral? We'll start with an example. I've got the double integral over this region D, which is this diamond-shaped region. Uh, and the integrand is 3x plus 6y in parentheses squared. Now, one issue with this diamond region, even though it's very simple, it's just made up of line segments, it's neither a type 1 nor is it a type 2 region. You can still evaluate the integral. You're just going to have to break the region into two parts. And uh, each one of the parts, so the, the part to the left of the y-axis and the part to the right of the y-axis uh, are both type 1. So that's one way I could evaluate this. So I could write it uh, d1 being the part that is between negative one half x minus one and one half x plus one so the left side and then the right side but when you look at this certainly you say to yourself wow if i could just rotate this figure a little bit straighten it out um, maybe what i could do is draw some new axes instead of using the x and y axes let me think about using some u and v axes, which are parallel. So the u axis is parallel to two of the sides, and the v axis is parallel to two, the other two sides. Uh, you know, maybe that would be a better coordinate system to use. And in fact, if I rewrite the equations, for the boundary lines of this region D, I can see that two of the opposite sides are x minus 2y equals negative 2, and x minus 2y equals positive 2. And so that suggests that maybe I could make the substitution u equals x minus 2y. Then the other opposite sides are x plus 2y equals 2, and x plus 2y equals negative 2. So maybe I could say v is x plus 2y. And in that case, I would get a new region, but call it d hat, which is based on these u and v definitions. And now in the u v coordinate system, I would actually have a square. So that would change something very complicated. I'd have to have two integrals with very complicated bounds into a single integral with very simple bounds. And that would be our goal in making the change of variables. Now, the equations connecting my original coordinate system to my new coordinate system is what we call a transformation. 
do not be intimidated by the word transformation. Transformation is just another word for function. So in our case, what we're looking at, the input is an ordered pair, u comma v, uh, some point in that uv plane. The output is also an ordered pair, but this time x comma y in the xy plane. And the way we write it is using function notation. We say t, open parentheses u comma v equals open parentheses x comma y, or t of u comma v equals x comma y. So if we think about it, that tells me that this x coordinate is a function of both u and v. So I'm going to write x as x equals uh, x of u comma v. And the same thing for the y coordinate. There's a function y where the y coordinate is given by y of u and v. In our example, we had u and v equaling functions of x and y, but that's not a problem. Uh, we can solve this system of equations for x and y and get equations for x in terms of u and v, y in terms of u and v. So in our transformation notation, t of u comma v would be one half parentheses u plus v comma one half parentheses u minus v. Now the fact that I was able to go from u equals and v equals to x equals and y equals tells me that this is actually a one-to-one -one function and we already know what its inverse is. T inverse of x comma y is our original equations, x plus two y and uh, x minus two y. Uh, that would be the coordinates of my point in the uv plane. So let's think about transformations a little bit more. The output of a transformation is called an image. So if we think about this square here, it's just a set of points in the uv plane. Each one of those points can be transformed giving this transformation to a point in the xy plane. And so when I say find the image of the square, that means what does the image of all the points look like? In other words, what shape am I going to get after I apply this transformation to this square? Will it be a, a square, a, a diamond? Will it be something completely different? Well, the way that we're gonna go about this is we're going to just look at the side, each one of the four sides and determine the boundary of the image. And once we know the boundary, then we can just fill it in. So let's go through them one at a time. So our first side is on the u axis. And I'll be using this transformation. So that means x equals u squared minus v squared, y equals t2 uv. And my first side here, this line segment on the u axis, that's where v equals 0, and u goes between 0 and 1. Well, I can put v equals 0 into both of my equations for x and y, and that would tell me that y would have to equal 0, and u would have to equal I'm sorry, x would have to equal u squared. Now, let's think about this. As u goes between 0 and 1, if I think about the uh, equation of the, a parabola, um, as the input goes from 0 to 1, the output also goes from 0 to 1. So I can square each part here, and I can say that u squared is also going to go from 0 to 1. Well, why did I look at that? Because that's what x is. x is u squared. So that tells me the image of 
this line segment S1 is another line segment. It's going to be y equals 0. So on the x-axis, going from uh, 0 to 1. So it looks like this transformation does not change that line segment at all. So that's interesting. We have a completely different situation with our second line segment. That is a portion of the line uh, u equals 1. And for the values between 0 and 1 for v. Well, I can put u equals 1 into each of my x and y equations. So I'll have x equals 1 minus v squared. y equals 2v. And I can multiply this range here uh, by 2. And because I want 2v in the middle, because that's what y is. Now I can also solve y equals 2v for v. v would equal 1 half y. And substituting that, I would get x equals 1 minus 1 fourth y squared. And y goes between 0 and 2. That is half of a y squared parabola. It's a negative 1 fourth y squared, so it opens to the left. Its vertex is here on the x-axis when x equals 1. So I get this curve right here. So that is something different. So this line segment under this transformation gets mapped onto this portion of a parabola. All right, what about S3? So in S3, now V equals 1, and U is going between 0 and 1. Again, I'll make my substitution. And here I can do something similar. I can multiply the U between 0 and 1 to say 2U is between 0 and 2, because Y equals 2U. And then I can solve y equals 2u for u, u will equal 1 half y. And so that means that x is 1 fourth y squared minus 1. And again, y goes between 0 and 2. So the image of this line segment, this horizontal line segment, is another half parabola. Its vertex is at negative 1. And its y values go from 0 to 2. So I get this blue curve right here as the image of the line segment up here. All right, what about our final line segment? We're back uh, on one of the axes, this time the v-axis, where u equals 0. And v is going between 0 and 1. So putting 0 in for u, I get y equals 0 again. Now x is negative v squared. And so um, I know from the same reasoning that 0 in v squared goes between 0 and 1. Now if I, said, if I multiply this inequality, by negative 1, I'll have negative v squared in the middle, but I'll have to reverse the inequalities. So I'll have negative 1 on the left, 0 on the right, negative v squared in the middle. And I want the negative v squared in the middle because that is my expression for x. So I get another line segment y equals 0, but now x is going from negative 1 to 0. So my boundaries have mapped onto a line segment, half a parabola, another half parabola, and another line segment. So this is the image of that square under this particular transformation. So it would seem like um, 
what I would like to do if I had this as a domain of integration would be apply the inverse transformation and uh, evaluate the integral over this simple square as opposed to this more complicated shape down here. So let's see how we would do that. We've got an idea of how a transformation can change the domain of integration. So that would help us get our bounds of integration. Given the transformation, we can just use algebra to be able to convert the integrand. So the piece that's missing is how do we determine the relationship between du dv and the area differential dA, which is usually dx dy. So to do that, we're just going to take a small rectangle S in the UV plane and look at its image in the XY plane R under some general transformation T. The actual formula for T, uh, it, it, we're not going to know. We're just going to say, suppose I have a small, and by small, I mean it has lengths delta U and delta V for the uh, length and width respectively. And it gets transformed under T into some general shape over here. Uh, and we're calling its image then R. We're going to say that the lower uh, left-hand corner has coordinates U0, V0. And the image of u naught comma v naught is x naught y naught, uh, which we're going to put in the left-hand corner of our image here. We're going to use some of our uh, vector tools to help us analyze this. So let's go ahead and let uh, r, r with the vector of u comma v, now that is going to be a something in the xy plane, it's going to be the position vector of t of u comma v, so it's going to be the position vector of x comma y, where x comma y is the image of u comma v. So the components are the x and y coordinates of that particular point. So now, again, let's look at the sides of our rectangle, but we're going to look at two, the two sides that are adjacent to our particular point u naught v naught. So this lower side, I'm going to say, is going to get mapped onto this side over here. And so in that lower side, v naught is fixed, and u naught varies from u naught over to u naught plus delta u. So its image is a curve, and I can write that using our vector notation. So v naught, remember r depends on both u and v, but here we're keeping v naught fixed. So I can calculate the tangent vector by taking the partial of r with respect to u, and that means I would just take the partial of x and the partial of y with respect to u and evaluate them at my initial point right here. Now it'll give me the components of the tangent vector of this curve. And in shorthand, I might just say the partial with respect to u has components partial of x with respect to u, partial of y with respect to u. I want to do something similar with the left side. So this side of S, it gets mapped onto this curve in the xy plane using our transformation t. 
Now on that side, u is fixed and it's v is my variable. So I could go ahead and calculate its tangent vector at the point x naught y naught by taking the partial of r with respect to v. And its components are just going to be the partial of x with respect to v and the partial of y with respect to v. All right, so that's just a, a little bit of review of how um, we can use vectors to help us establish some information about the region R. But really what we want to know about the region R is how does the area of the region S correspond to the area of the region R? I'd like to be able to calculate the area of the region R in terms of delta U and delta V. Well, let's draw a vector from the corners here. I'd like to take the um, vector from x naught comma y naught up to the image of uh, this corner right here where I have u naught and then v naught plus delta v, so the upper left-hand corner, its image in the xy plane. Let me go ahead and connect those together with a vector, and I'll call that vector a. And I'll make a... Okay, before we go on. So notice that we could write this in terms of our position vector r, because the head is the image of u naught comma v naught plus delta v. The tail is on x naught comma y naught, which is the image of u naught v naught. Now I want to draw another vector going across the other two corners. So the starting having its tail again at x naught y naught, going over to the other corner, which is the image of this corner here, and its coordinates are going to be u naught plus delta u, and then v naught. So again, I could write that in terms of my r vector, my position vector there. Now, why would I draw these vectors a and b? Well, I know a lot about vectors. And one thing that I know about vectors is that if I take two vectors and form their cross product, the magnitude of that cross product is going to be the area of this parallelogram determined by the two vectors. And so the area of this parallelogram is something that I can compute. I can calculate that using the cross product and taking its magnitude. And that is going to be a very good approximation to the area of R when delta U and delta V are small. And since this is calculus, we start with an approximation and then we get a better approximation we would take a smaller delta u and delta v. And then in the limit, our approximations give us uh, the exact value that we're looking for. So let's see how we can calculate that uh, magnitude of the cross product uh, b cross a. So recall that um, the partial derivative of r with respect to u can be written as the limit as delta u goes to zero of this difference quotient. Well, the look at the numerator of this difference quotient. This difference quote numerator here is exactly the value of the vector b. So what does that tell me? That if delta u is small, then the vector b 
is approximately delta u times the partial of r with respect to u. In other words, I'd get the delta u times a vector with components partial x with respect to u, partial y with respect to u. And we can use a similar reason for the definition of the partial of r with respect to v. And when delta v is small, my vector a is going to be essentially delta v times my tangent vector, the partial of r with respect to v. That is, it's delta v times the vector with components partial of x with respect to v and partial of y with respect to v. All right, so now I have components for A and B. Now, I want to form the cross product. Remember, I can always embed these vectors in R3 by just setting the k component equal to zero. And so I can estimate my area of R, which I'm going to call delta A, as being the magnitude of the cross product B cross A. So B cross A, remember B has the components partial of X with respect to U, partial of Y with respect to U. Uh, and then I'm going to put a zero in there so I can make it embedded in R3 to form the cross product. The A vector has components partial of X with respect to B, V, partial of Y with respect to V, and then zero again. The delta U and the delta V are just constants that are constant multipliers, so I can bring them out in front of the cross product. And then I still need to take the magnitude. So if I just look at the cross product of these vectors without the delta u and the delta v. I'm just going to get this determinant times the k vector. The only non-zero component is k. And of course that makes sense. Remember that the cross product vector has got to be orthogonal to the plane which contains the two input vectors. In this case the plane is the xy plane. So it makes sense that the cross product points in the z direction. So I would still need to take, uh, so that only tells me the value of this cross product inside the other bars, which indicate magnitude. But I've got it down to just a two by two determinant. So these bars here represent determinant. I'm just following a, a two by two determinant. So the magnitude of delta u times delta v times this two by two determinant times the k vector. Well, the magnitude of k is just one. So it'll just be delta u times delta v. Those are positive numbers that are going to be multiplied times the absolute value of this determinant. Now, this determinant is so important that it has its own notation. And we use these this partial symbol with, a, again, a fraction to say, we're going to say partial x comma y over partial u comma v. So x and y then are the, what appears in the denominator, I mean the numerators in the top of these partial derivatives, u and v appear in the bottom. And not only does it have its own notation, it has its own name. We call this the Jacobian. So it's the Jacobian of x comma y with respect to u comma v. That is this determinant right there. So if I wanted to estimate the area, if I want to get an estimate for delta A, delta A would be the absolute value of that Jacobian times delta U, delta 
v. And I want to emphasize that these lines are not part of the determinant notation. The Jacobian itself is a determinant. These lines indicate that I know the determinant can be positive or negative, but we're trying to calculate in the magnitude of a vector. So if it were negative, I'd have to take its absolute value. And so now if I let the delta u and delta v go to zero, I'll get my differential dA is connected to du dv by the absolute value of the Jacobian. So now we've got all three pieces. In order to do our change of variables, we'd have to find out the image of the domain of integration under the transformation which will help us determine then um, what the bounds of integration are. And hopefully they're very simple bounds, otherwise it might not be worth doing. We have to change our integrand to our new variables u and v. But if we're given the transformation, that should just be basic algebra. And then we need to say that dA is going to be the Jacobian of x comma y with respect to u comma v times du dv. Now, this Jacobian sometimes would be complicated to determine because maybe I only have equations for u and v in terms of x and y. And we might see this in some of our examples where we have very simple equations for u and v in terms of x and y, and it would be very complicated to solve for x and y. We don't have to solve for x and y. What I could do is calculate the Jacobian of u and v with respect to x and y, and then take as a reciprocal. Because I don't need to know all of the uh, entries of this determinant. I just need to be able to know the absolute value of that determinant. And so I could use this formula here. So in other words, if I know the partial of u with respect to x, the partial of u with respect to y, the partial of v with respect to x, and the partial of v with respect to y, there's no need to solve for x and y. I can calculate this determinant, take its reciprocal, and that would give me the value of the determinant I'm looking for. So we do not have to solve for x and y if I have equations for u and v, and I can calculate these partial derivatives. So let's end with a simple example, and then I'm going to make a separate video where we actually evaluate some integrals. So let's look at something we already know about, polar coordinates. So here, instead of u and v, we're going to use r and theta as our new variables. And we know the formula that connects x and y to uh, u and v. So uh, x is r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. Oops, I said u and v, but I meant r and theta. So then I can calculate my partial derivatives. Partial of x with respect to r is just cosine theta. Partial of y with respect to r is just sine theta. The partial of x with respect to theta would be negative r sine theta. And the partial of y with respect to theta is r cosine theta. So the determinant of that those partial derivatives is going to give me well, r times cosine squared theta plus r times sine squared theta. I can factor the r out. That would leave me with cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta inside the parentheses, and that would just be r. And so now using our new technique, we have determined that indeed dA should be the Jacobian of xy with respect to r theta in absolute value times dr d theta. And that's how we get r dr d theta. Well, as I said, I will make a subsequent video with more examples.